Good evening, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the second in our occasional series of Normandy myth busting, where we're looking at something probably from the Normandy campaign that is a legend, a myth, something, and kind of take it apart and, and conclude whether it is or isn't a myth. Before I bring in my guest tonight, today, I want to remind people that this is a situation where my guest contacted me and said, look, I've got a subject. I'd like to talk about it. He's a friend of Michael Ackerman, who did that wonderful show about the Vida Stones Nest on Omaha Beach a few weeks ago. Another friend, another uh, filmmaker, my guest is. So this is a, 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 an alert to you watching that you don't have to be a Sunday Times best-selling author to be on my channel. You don't have to be teaching history professionally at a university. You can just be someone who's got a passion about something or has been studying something or a website. So if you've got ideas, please, please contact me. Um, as always, all the details need are in the YouTube description. You can pull back that to find out social media links and everything else. But without further ado, I'm going to bring my guest in, Brian McCallion, and uh, he's over in the USA. So good evening. Or well, it's still morning where you are, I think, isn't it? Oh, no, it's actually uh, just afternoon. It's uh, just afternoon. Here. So, yep, we still have the sun for a little bit. Good. So we are talking about Normandy, and we are talking about um, this uniform misunderstand but before i do that let me tell let you i'll ask you to tell the folks what it is you do and where you work and your military interest sure so i'm a filmmaker and i'm also a realtor working real estate and stuff so film is my passion at the moment um i have been involved in museums and research and history for well over 15 years worked in multiple tank museums and actually working at tank museums is how i found out about this myth because uh, i did a lot of like research into the second armed division during the second world war all the way from Benning to Berlin. So that was the first place I heard this. But before we get into that, I just want to reiterate what Paul said. You don't have to be an expert or written a thousand books to know history. Like I have a podcast as well. And we just had an amazing um, guy on. His name is James Gregory. He wrote a book about Sergeant York that's going to change the whole narrative. And he tells people, he yells at them, like, just because I have a piece of paper doesn't mean I'm a better historian than you. You know, there are people that don't have any degrees that he will talk to that it's like, you know, way more than I ever will. So, you know, having pieces of paper just is nice and stuff. But if you have a passion and you research it and you go to the ninth degree, present it. You know, it's there's people that want to hear it because yeah. this is the only way that you solve facts and mysteries is networking and getting out there. So never, you know, think you need something from a university or whatever. Just history is awesome. It's for everybody. It's free. So just get Thank out you. there and research it. Yeah. And the good thing about YouTube, it doesn't need to be peer reviewed as well. I mean, <laughs> any, anyone can say anything on YouTube. I mean, I'm very grateful that I do have a lot of good guests and people do seem to take what we're saying seriously, the history behind it. But it doesn't have to go through the rigors of academic peer review with citations needed. But anyway, you have come down with a PowerPoint. And folks, this will be a kind of a short show. The whole idea about these normally myth buses is they're kind of trying to bring people into the channel to take on board the longer shows. So this one will be well under an hour. We're aiming for about 30, 40 minutes. So this is Brian's PowerPoint. We'll just power through it. Ask any questions you you, you may have, but uh, and I will have a few comments to make. But basically, this is this story. They, they did, uh, well, I'll let Brian do it. There's a, a camouflage story from Normandy. So over to you, Brian. So we'll start with the myth. The myth was, was that in the summer of 1944, during the Normandy campaign, there was a camouflage uniform that was issued out to certain to select units of the 2nd Armored Division and other American units that was misidentified by other Americans, GIs or, or Brits as well, and they shot the shit out of them because they thought they were SS soldiers. That is the myth. And throughout time, that's been perpetuated about why the Americans, especially in Europe, didn't use camouflage. Because everybody looks at Marines in the Pacific, and they had frog skin for a short period of time, like the Battle of Tarawa, everybody knows about, you know, camouflage. So why didn't they do that in Europe? Well, this myth comes up of, well, SS soldiers. And there's a little bit of, of fact in it, but not connected to the camo. So it's pretty interesting. So to begin, here's just a photo of some second armored guys, um, late Cobra. This is uh, probably like July 31st of 44. Um, so yeah, dudes hanging out with camis. So if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so you have to contextualize everything. So to talk about what happened in Normandy, let's go back a little bit to North Africa campaign. And at this time, the standard uniform of the American army was the M41 field jacket and a set of wools, uh, M38 wools, I believe. And you had a khaki jacket and you had, you know, wool pants. And that was what everybody looked like. When you went to basic, this is what guys looked like. When you went to North Africa, this is what guys looked like. Sicily, Italy, this is what American soldiers wore and would 
you know, this is what a GI looked like. Now, there were problems with the color of the uniform, even in the early stages of the Tunisian campaign, uh, late 42, early 43, where guys were complaining that it was too light, which is crazy to think about for North Africa. Because you think about North Africa, you think about sand and everything, but they were complaining that the khaki was way too light. So some units, like the 9th and the 1st, you actually see guys would take their jackets and turn them inside out, like the photo on the left. This is an M41 jacket that's turned inside out because the wool liner was darker and actually blend in better with the surrounding hedgerow or, or whatever, even like in North Africa, the shrubs and everything. So very early on, there was these issues with the uniform. Just it was too light. The other thing that they had problems with is that they had very small like slant side pockets. And that's because the 41 jacket was actually based off of Windbreaker from Sears Roebuck. Sears Roebuck was this, you know, they were a big company, you, you know, they made clothes and stuff. And the U.S. government literally was like, we'll take that one. And they made a military version of it. So the joke was, is that you can only fit a hand grenade and a piece of chewing gum in each pocket. They're like, give us pockets we can live out of. So because of this, the color problem and the pocket problem, the U.S. Army went and they redesigned the uniform. They said, let's give these guys something they could fight out of, a jacket. And they did with the M43 field jacket, which came out halfway through the war. So we'll go to the next slide. And, and this is, just to, to jump in, this is mm -hmm. the M41. I've done in my reenactor days. It wears really quickly. Um, the <laughs> pockets, because they're kind of side pockets, things fall out of mm -hmm. them. It's got a wool liner, which means if you sometimes you're too hot and sometimes you're not you're not warm enough. So the whole point is, is the armies are racing to bring in a system that would eventually, we're skipping ahead a bit, the layering system of all modern armies. Because anybody who served in the military watching this, be they in Norway, Canada, the USA, Britain or whatever, over the last 40 or 50 years will basically recognize the smock there or the jacket there. A four pocket tunic is pretty much what everybody's been wearing since since this that jacket was introduced. So this is the evolution of uniforms generally, isn't it? It is. Yeah. You know, this it's amazing what standards were set during the Second World War that are just commonplace today. And that you, until you go back in the history, you're like, wow, they didn't have any pockets. Like, how, where do you put your shit? You know, and, and we see where things went. So to get back into it. So the 43 jacket comes out and here's the jacket that's blends in with terrain and it's got huge pockets. And what's interesting is that so the 43 jacket is made in 1943. The first place it's used is Anzio. They do a field test with the third ID in Anzio. No problems at all. We'd love it. Make it for the troops. So they heavily start to make them. And in the spring of 44, they're being issued to replacements and new units in the States that have yet to go to Europe. All the units in Europe, like the 29th that have been waiting in England forever for the invasion, had older stuff. They had 41 jackets and wools. They didn't really have new stuff. They had everything they brought with them from England in 42. Um, some things like replacements, they would have new stuff. But generally, it was all older equipment. So you're used to wools and 41s. So there was a point during the Normandy campaign where 43 jackets showed up on the front line the same time that 41 jackets were. So to give an example, here's a photo of a 43 jacket being used by GI. This is a snapshot of footage that was taken from the same photo we saw in the last slide of the guy wearing the 41 jacket. So right in front of him is a guy wearing an inside out 41 and right behind him is a guy wearing a 43. So these jackets during the Normandy campaign started to mesh and you would see a mix of them. So this is where the problem they didn't realize started to begin. Next slide. So the other uniform that was in Normandy was the HBT uniform. HBT stands for herringbone twill, and it's basically a certain style weave. It's like a V weave. And there were three different versions of the uniform, first and second pattern HBTs. First, really the only difference is the pockets. The pockets that you see are a lot bigger on the second pattern. It was the most common pattern you saw in Normandy. These were issued out to the uh, assault regiments, um, like the 4th ID and the 29th, I know got a lot, and some units of the 1st. They got impregnated ones, actually, that were treated against gas so that they could fight, you know, if there was any German use of chemical weapons. The other HPT was the camouflage HPT, which basically was the second pattern, large pocketed HPTs, HP, you know, herringbone twill, but they were made in the frog skin Marine Corps camouflage. Now, frog skin, it's got a whole history in itself, but basically it was a camouflage that was slowly in development. It came up on the scene in 42, and the army was like, great, we need a camo, let's start making it. The Marine Corps didn't have any camo. The Marine Corps said, hey, can we use that pattern? And the army actually printed all the material for the Marine Corps during the war. So the army was the big supplier of it. And they started making uniforms. Hey, let's make some stuff. 
and they were experimenting. They made a HBT jungle suit, they called it, which was like a onesie that they sent a lot to the Pacific. And then they made this two-piece uniform based off the second pattern HBTs. Now, they had problems producing them in the States to the point where a lot of the fabric was actually shipped to England and it was uh, manufactured over there as part of the reverse lend lease program. Because a lot of people don't know this, but we had a big lend lease program in the States where we would send out basically everything to any country that needed it. But there were countries like the UK and Australia or nations that they would actually have reverse lend lease yeah. where a lot of field gear was made in the uh, UK for Americans. And you see a lot of different units. And it's all marked and made in Britain and that broad air and everything. So a lot of this uh, frog skin was actually made in the UK. And the way you can tell it's got red labels, very niche. But so those were the uniforms that were floating around. You have the 43 jacket, which was brand new. You have a 41 jacket, which everybody knew and loved. Well, not loved, but everybody knew. And then you have these HPT uniforms that are just showing up. So this is the world that we're now in. All these different uniforms. And, and guys are only really used to this old wool and khaki suit, you know, that I've seen since basic. So we'll go to the and, next And just slide. to jump yep. in also, mm -hmm. when we're talking about Normandy, we're also dealing with an enemy that's wearing lots of different kind of uniforms as well, because yes. there are Luftwaffe mm -hmm. ground divisions, there's mm -hmm. Falschermeg units, there's SS, Waffen SS, Wehrmacht, Kriegsmarine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in Normandy. Some have been in the service for two or three years. Some are new recruits. So they've got a whole variety of, of uniforms. And obviously, in the close confines of Normandy, recognition, camouflage, concealment becomes a big concern. So, so we're setting the scenes for where potentially misunderstandings come from. Yep. And the thing is, you know, you don't have a long period of time to decide if it's friend or foe, you know. So usually soldiers will go by silhouettes. Helmets was the biggest thing you hear from the war. The coal scuttle helmets I saw in the crowd, you know. Mm. So the other thing was, was a tunic. So if you saw something, you know, you have a very quick decision to make. And if you're used to seeing a certain type of tunic on a, on a soldier that's friendly, and all of a sudden it's a different style, then problems will occur. So, yeah, there's all these things going around. And just to touch on that, Paul, too, think of all the different German camouflages. You have Splinter, you have OK, you have Blurred Edge, you have Tello, you have, I mean, the list just goes on. Hungarian, I mean, holy shit. Every bit of European military hardware kit eventually made it to Normandy. There was even yeah. a T-34 as part of one of the SS units as a recovery vehicle. So, like, it's just crazy what we got there. Um, so, yeah, so continuing on. The other thing that you see as well with the Second Armored Division was they actually camouflaged their tanker jackets. And just is just to show the, the culture of camouflage that existed. It wasn't just like, look at this cool new uniform. You know, for Cobra, they camouflaged all the tracked vehicles, fully tracked vehicles. And they camouflaged uh, their pup tents, and they also camouflaged their tankers. So this comes up a lot. They just black spray painted anything that they think would make it blend in better. So even before they got these camis, they were really trying to think of what can we do to make us not stand out so much. So continuing on. Here's a bit of the camo HPT. So on the left, we have a swatch for what it will look like. And on the right, it's a good color photo of it in its environment. You know, it's a very bright camouflage. It doesn't really work well, to be honest, with Normandy because Normandy is very darker. And it's, it's, it would be a lot better literally just to flip your 41 jacket over and just have the dark wool side out than having this. But this is what's issued. So even on the scale of... Camouflage is really not a good one. <laughs> it's really a, a very bad low tier camouflage. And this is the first camouflage that was accepted by the U.S. government ever. There were some ghillie suits that were made in the First World War, but this is it. When you go back from ACUs or they use what Scorpion today, all the way back to 42, this is it. This is the sets all the stages. So they were issued this camouflage and they used it. The Second Armored Division was the biggest unit to receive it. One of the combat battalions um, because they would take armored units because the second armored division was a very big division and they would split it up into three different ones they had cca ccb and ccr for reserve and the different elements would have different parts of battalions so you'd have like a tank destroyer battalion or like platoon from tank destroyer battalion platoon of reconnaissance it's kind of like a bigger task force in a way so ccb second armored division they received hbt camouflage uniforms right before the Cobra offensive in I'd be July 24th, July 25th, 1944. And they literally just gave them and they were brand new. Whenever you see them in photos, they're brand new. Like they, they still have creases in them most of the time because these uniforms are were taken off a truck and given to soldiers. So CCB, Second Armored Division, wore these throughout the early stages of Cobra. There was also one battalion from the 30th ID, um, nicknames Roosevelt's SS, funnily enough, that received the camouflage as well 
and nobody really knows too much about how many they got and stuff. There actually is even some camouflage that shows up uh, in the Siege of Brest with some of the second yeah. ID guys um, later on, which is nobody really knows. Probably through some guy literally probably found a pile of them on the side of the road and said, oh, Yeah, I was doing some you know? research because I did a 30th Division tour mm. a few weeks ago and I was oh, cool. going through a pile of photos of the latter part of the, the Cobra campaign. Mm -hmm. And there was like in a group of 30 of the 30th, I forget which, I think it was the 117th Regiment, mm -hmm. you saw like one guy out of 30 with with, with that on. You think, well, where the hell did he get that from? It's like it wasn't obviously done to a unit, but somehow a few turned up there. It's funny. I mean, you always get one-offs. I mean, there's a famous photo of a BAR gunner from the war with a German splinter helmet cover on. I mean, you know, you're always going to get that guy. There's always that guy. But um, it, it's interesting how it's disseminated. But basically, for this conversation, you know, this is just about the 2nd Armored Division. This is where right. everything starts. So they go into Cobra. This one unit has the camouflage. Now, at this time, you have the same issue going on with the 43 jacket being issued. So we have two new uniforms we're talking about here. We have the M43 field jacket, which you can see in the back here, and the camouflage uniform that was being issued. So when guys were talking about the new uniform, there wasn't even a basic understanding of what that new uniform was. Because depending on where you were, depends on what you got, you know? And there were even some guys that were replacements in the second armor division, like this guy, he's an observer. This was taken north of Mortain on, I think, uh, the 10th of August of 44. Um, you know, he's got a 43 jacket mixed in with all these other guys. So we have all these jackets and things floating around and people that are looking for certain items on a German soldier to shoot at. So we're going to the next slide. We have, this is a nice shot of some guys who are in camouflage um, in Normandy. Or sorry, this is a late Normandy campaign, but still you can kind of see how it blends and everything. And they wore a lot of scrim and stuff. Uh, so next slide. Another nice camouflage shot. You know, we have a mix of not camouflage and camouflage. And it's funny, on some of the more rainy days or, or wetter days, you see them wearing tanker jackets over their camis, which is funny because you, you see that they valued it as a uniform and not as an article of camouflage. Because why would you put something over your camouflage if you're trying to stay concealed? Especially this big, giant khaki thing like a tanker jacket, which is totally obvious, where guys in the same unit were trying to camouflage them with paint. So, yep. Uh, next slide. Another nice shot of camis and uh, poor K98. <laughs> Something people forget is that first thing you do after you, you know, take over a battlefield is you got to clear it. And involving that is disarming weapons. So a lot of times the bend the barrels or throw the bolts away. But so unfortunate gun, but a nice shot of the camis and uh, the scrim. So the Second Armor Division used this a lot. Some more shots of it being used um, very heavily. You know, guys got it, they wore it. Why not? And, and just worth mentioning, mm -hmm. uh, you know that. At the time of Cobra, Cobra was a lot of press interest, a lot of interest from the world in it. It was Bradley's um, ambitious plan to break out of Normandy. And because it was the another D-Day, in a sense, the press corps were there. So there are, and if you want to do this you're up for yourselves, folks, there are lots of photos of 2nd Armored Division guys wearing this camo pattern in Normandy oh, yeah. because there were obviously a lot of photographers there. I'm reminded of the fact of the photographer who took the photos of the guys in the 506 with the mohawk and the and the and the war paint it was only about 30 or 40 guys did that but those photos reached millions and suggested a lot more people were, were doing that than actually were so that we're setting the scene here folks for what why these photos exist in like large quantities the arrival of different uniforms into the theater and then we'll we'll get onto this idea of the of the mistake identity so um yeah i'll hand two, it back to you two people that you might have heard of that were attached to the second hour division for the breakout in cobra was ernest hemingway who's a reporter at the yep. time and uh robert capra so you know you have one of the most famous journalist writers in the world and then also probably at the time the most famous reporter in the world with the unit. And they took a lot of the very famous photos of, uh, there was, Capper was in a Jeep behind a half track and this old man came out and was handing them milk. And all the guys have camis on and they're leaning over to get it. And that's a very famous photo. And again, that, you know, he put that on Life Magazine all over the world. So that was another reason that you see camis a lot during that time. Like you said, you, you have such a big media presence because everybody wanted to get to Paris. It's the breakout, this is gonna happen. We're finally gonna get there. So let's be on, on the, you know, the front. And, and, and also worth noting that it wasn't until late July that American forces in Normandy really start dealing with Amer uh, German SS units who are the ones mm -hmm. who are wearing more camouflage. So they're seeing camouflage on the enemy and different uniform more 
frequently than they had been in the early campaign when it was units like the 352nd and, and other coastal defence divisions near the beaches. There wasn't as much camo around. So when Cobra smashes through Fritz Bailin's Panzerleer division, Panzerleer, okay, not SS, but an armour division, a lot of their guys would be wearing camouflage as well. So the, the camouflage is suddenly becoming a, a thing that everybody is seeing on the battlefield. And at this time, too, more tan and stuff, you have the 116th Winter Division, which is they had a lot of tan water smocks and everything. You know, so again, you get even these these really good here units that have camouflage. You know, before those, like you said, it was basically FJ or SS or maybe LFD where you'd see something. But even then, those guys were scraping the bottom of the barrel at this point. So it was really a mismatch. FJR6 before D-Day was half the unit wasn't jump qualified. Half yeah, of them exactly. were using regular stall helms. So it's like it's just. Yeah. So, yeah, it was exactly. just a culture of, of seeing things. So, but this camouflage was used a lot. In another great photo on the right, you see some guys in their camouflage tankers. So it's a nice contrast to show you know the actual frog skin being used. But uh, again, it just goes to show that they didn't respect. They used it as a uniform because why would you put khaki over camouflage unless it's just a jacket, you know? So going on to the next slide. Um, so here's the problem, and actually, Paul brought up a really good point. Before the Normandy campaign and everything, for the first six, seven weeks, sorry, of the early Normandy campaign, you're fighting like the 916th and the 352nd and these just general here units. And a lot of those guys were issued with the M43 HPT tunics, which is on the left. Now, it's an older German style tunic. Um, you know, it's been around since the 20s, basically. It's it's a World War One German tunic that has pockets thrown onto it. The German soldier in the First World War literally realized they need pockets to fight out of. And that's where the idea before pocketed German tunic came out of. So you have American soldiers that are fighting guys that are dressed in M43 tunics on the left for weeks on end. And then this new brand new jacket that no one's ever seen before, unless you are a replacement or you're from a new division from the States shows up and it's what's pictured on the right. Now you tell me what's different besides the swastika in the color. There's really not a lot of difference between an M43 jacket and a German M43 jacket. They have the same name literally everything and that's because that's what soldiers need they need tunics that you can fight out of with deep large pockets this is just what was needed so as this camouflage is being used by certain subunits of the second armor division this starts to show up across the whole cobra front and just at the same time you now have this rumor going around that the new uniform is getting people killed this we're seeing these guys that look just like germans we're shooting the shit out of them that you know, why are you wearing German uniform? So this is where the problem arises, is the fact that the M43 uniform, which as seen before, was mixed in with the 41 jackets and everything else, was just not known to combat veterans. And, you know, the camouflage was used for such a short period of time by small units that who knows what the new uniform is? You know, there's two new uniforms and people, there's one rumor. So are you going to get shot because you're wearing the new uniform that you were just given two days ago? No, you're going to throw it away. But if you're a replacement and you said the new uniform is getting people killed, I'm glad I don't have that new uniform. Yeah, this is what I got when I was in the army. You know, like so. It, this is where it begins. The M43 field jackets what was actually was causing these friendly fire incidents due to replacements and units like the 35th ID. It just showed up from uh, the states that had all 43 jackets. Um, they were heavily involved in the state low campaign. You know, they were next to the 29th and the 29th has this history in the Normandy campaign of actually having friendly fire incidents. The first friendly fire incident they had was on the morning of the 7th of June when the 2nd Infantry Division, a unit that had basically all dark colored second pattern HPTs, not even camouflage HPTs, but just dark shaded ones, went through their lines and they shot the shit out of them. These nerve wracked 29ers that had just lived through the, the horrors of, you know, Omaha Beach and they saw Guys that look just like the people that were shooting at them. So they shot them. So there's this culture of friendly fire incidents evolved around HPT in Normandy, but you don't really get it unless you really get into the minutiae of everything. So continuing uh, and, and let's on, remind yeah. ourselves that friendly fire has always been an issue and will always oh, be an yeah. issue. Friendly fire mm -hmm. incidents were happening with the, with the airborne on D-Day, British airborne mm -hmm. they're having at night. There's all sorts of stories of friendly fire. It's not a new thing. What what is what is new is 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 the trying to apportion blame on a particular thing, mm -hmm. um, and and this is where we're going to get this idea of the camouflage uniform being the culprit. So I'll let you kind of bring that up in a second. So we'll move on to the next photo. So yep, here's the 35th ID guy with an M43 jacket. 
right around pre, you know, St. Low Cobra and everything. And if you were fighting for seven weeks against guys, German soldiers wearing M43 jackets, and some dude from Idaho walks through the fucking Edro wearing a four pocketed dark green tunic, you're going to ask him where he's from or you're going to shoot him. You're going to shoot him because you've been fighting guys that look just like him for seven weeks. Oh, it was a mistake, whatever. But this is what happened. You know, guys in combat, you look for recognition, you look for what the enemy looks like. And an M43 American field jacket looks nothing like an M41 American field jacket. So yeah. that can't be an American. That's got to be a German. And just to touch on your thing, Paul, about friendly fire incidents and stuff, my favorite, it's horrible. And thank God nobody died. But my favorite fire, friendly fire story for Normandy was came from a second armored vet. They just went up Omaha Beach. You know, it was the 8th of June. He was part of the really early uh, divisional train. He had a brand new half track. He literally just on waterproofed it, drove it up, went to park at a house to this uh, HQ, gets out of it. As he's walking across the street, he hears a plane, P-51 or whatever. And he's like, oh, that's cool. And he goes and look up at it. And the guy releases his drop tanks. And they're coming, not anywhere to a field for him. And the fucking whole like HQ scatters, and these two drop tanks land right in his brand new half track and explode, and destroys like half the whole company area. Wow! But they all lived, and that's just a story they used to tell at reunions. It was funny, but you got to think about that. You know, it's like that pilot. The last thing he's thinking about is who's on the ground. You know, oh fuck, there's a fighter. I got to go fight. Drop my tanks and let's go. So friendly fire happens even if you don't want it to happen. You know, it's just accidents happen when you have this many people doing these dangerous things in the front line. And um, and I suppose just to reference Cobra, uh, the, the Cobra is a massive assault. I mean, there's the second, third, fourth, and sixth U.S. Army divisions involved. There's the first, fourth, uh, all the other infantry divisions as well. There's all the air support as well. So over a few, the first few days of that, a lot of people were suddenly in combat who hadn't been in combat properly, fully engaged, some of them, because it was taking so long to build up the armor division. So if you've got more men facing the enemy, for example, as we did have in the last week of July, can perhaps compare to the first week of July, I don't, I'm not going to do the maths of how many more people were engaged, in the, but let's say it's double, then you would expect there to be double at least the number of friendly fire instances because there'd be double of everything because there's double of the combat involved. Where the fact that Cobra was going the Allied way is neither here nor there. If people are engaged with the enemy, there are going to be more of everything, more fatalities, more injury, more, more wounds, more everything, more more uh, uh, cases of mistaken identity. So we're 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 get, getting rapidly to the to the nub of this um this subject. So I'll move the slide on again. So there we go. Yep. And yeah, you know, think about the bombing casualties and stuff from the early Cobra, uh, like breakout things, you know, that was horrible. Only like U.S. general or I think it was a congressman as well was killed in that. So yeah, more people fighting, more problems happening. So yeah, so there's some more shots or shots from uh, St. Lowe, just again, to reinforce and show that the M43 jacket was very prevalent during this time period. And if you talk to most historians or reenactors, they'll be like, the M43 jacket came into uh, the ETO in the late part of 43 or 44, which is total bullshit, proven by all these photos. On the right is a still taken from footage north of Mortain, which is from the same guy that was the observer I showed earlier. Um, another 43 jacket. He's a replacement in the 2nd Armored Division. There's guys behind him wearing camis. There's guys in front of him wearing 41 jackets. So it was just a very transitional time for the U.S. Army, you know, fighting this huge campaign, you know, tens of thousands of men. And they're introducing this new uniform that no one's ever seen before. So moving forward, you know, Guys were throwing away the uniform they thought was get, was was getting them killed. But in reality, it wasn't. It was just this thing that happened to be issued at the same time that another thing was getting people killed. But in two months from when this events happened, late July, everybody was wearing 43 jackets. They can get their hands on one by the fall because they're great. They're warm. They have the layering system. They have huge pockets. Who wouldn't want one? Do you want the really shitty old jacket that's going to get you killed because it's really bright and it's got horrible pockets? Or do you want the really awesome like Cadillac of, of combat jackets where you can just put everything you need in it, live out of a jacket and not have to carry anything else? Like it was really a no brainer. So moving throughout time, people just racked up the friendly fire incidents to the early stages of Cobra to the camouflage because, oh, well, it was used for a short period of time. Certain units had it, whatever. That's what happened. But no. The real culprit of this whole thing is the M43 field jacket because it just looks way too much like a M43 German tunic. And that's what these yeah. guys were fighting forever. 
and ever, and, it, and it's and just ever. different. You know, it, it looks yeah. like the drone, but it's just different. And you know, I was going to make the point of the M41 basically kind of stops at your waist. I mean, it, it yeah. goes down a little bit, as does the British battle dress stops at the waist. Mm -hmm. The enemy were the ones wearing the jacket that comes halfway down the knees, and sadly, the Americans are wearing a jacket that have, comes halfway down the knees. You can begin to see where the, the misunderstandings are coming from, folks. And we've got that. There's a photo that one of the famous photos on the right of the camouflage thing. Now, what's mm -hmm. interesting, I'll let you uh, I'll give your opinion, is, is where on earth this myth of the camouflage uniform being responsible for the friendly fire stories came from? Because in my prep for this, I kept finding internet articles. I kept finding references to it. I, I of the, it, it, it was the camouflage uniform causing the problems, but I cannot find the first one. I, do, you, do you know where it started? As far as I could tell from talking to the veterans and stuff, somebody just came up with this myth that the uniform is getting people killed. And that's what they heard. And they said, this thing? And they go, well, it's new. And they threw it away. It was just this misconception. And it probably happened with a random incident where, some GI saw a GI and said, oh, fuck, I didn't recognize what he was wearing. And just due to the telephone game, the yeah. facts get lost, the rumor spreads, you know? So it just got disseminated to the new uniform is killing people. And yeah. I, I would put money on the fact that this happened earlier in July when the new unit started showing up, but it just wasn't on a big enough scale like, the op like Cobra was, you know, where the rumor really got out, where this was really a problem. But again, because everybody's wearing the jacket in a few months, it's not an issue. And another funny thing I actually just realized to put in here as well, weather is a big factor, you know, in combat and stuff. And during the Normandy campaign, it was pretty cold. Like, you know, it was, I know in June, it was like mid fifties and like low forties most of the time and didn't get really warm until the first two weeks of August, where I think, cause you can look up the French meteorological data. They've yeah, been keeping yeah, it yeah. since the 1840s. Like, you know, basically got really warm in the early part of August. And you see guys not wearing their jackets. Everybody's wearing it on their cartridge belts. And all of a sudden, this idea of friendly fire goes away. So isn't it funny that like you have this very short period of time where it's cold and everybody's wearing their, their jackets and there's this friendly fire incidents, the new uniform's getting people killed. Oh, and then it gets really warm and nobody's wearing jackets and then it goes away. So, mm. you know, maybe guys are wearing their 43s less to a point where you weren't having these incidents. And that by the time it got cold again, post Paris, you know, we're talking September now, more guys have the 43 jackets. So there could have been some guys like, oh, oh, I shot a guy back. Oh, fuck. You know, like the realized later on. But who's going to write about that? Who's going to talk about that little footnote during a four or five year experience of war? So I really think that it was just a rumor that started somewhere. And again, telephone game. And that's it. So yeah. I will say this, though, just to end it. There were no incidents as far as we can tell. I can conclusively say this where Americans were shot because they were wearing camouflage uniforms. But there are three cases of GIs that were wounded wearing the camouflage. They woke up in aid stations or field hospitals, and they had to convince the staff that they were Americans. There's one very interesting case from late July, early August, where this guy ended up at a field hospital. He woke up, he had shell shock and everything, and he woke up next to a bunch of Germans, and he goes, what the fuck? And he go, he told this nurse who was there like, Hey, you know, I'm American. And she scolded him and said, you should be happy that they saved your life. You kraut. He was like, I'm from Iowa. And he literally he had to convince this, this American nurse that he was a GI. And these two other instances that happened as well. So there were some instances of not misunderstanding what it was and rear line, you know, people say rent, whatever, you know, mistaking this new uniform because they were just used to seeing camp. Oh, it's guys get camouflage on. He's a, he's a wounded German, put him in that pile, you know? So that's the only real basis. The myth has in of like, you know, misidentification, but it has nothing to do with guys getting shot in combat. No, definitely. And Stephen, one of the viewers just sent me a photo, mm -hmm. which I'm, I can't get ready to upload on screen of a mm -hmm. British, two British guys, uh, with a, a guy with the camouflage with his hands, so they've, they've got an American, and there's they're obviously. I think I think I know. It's wearing a, he's wearing the suit, I believe, right? Um, and there's a number four T in the photo as well. I believe that was uh, taken. There's a there should be an SS guy as well in one of those photos too, wearing a smock. But there there was a British sniper school that was set up uh, outside of Cannes near the airfield in late June of '44, and a bunch of photos come out of that place um, where they're like, "Oh, look at these, you know, Brits using frog skin camouflage and stuff," and it was just the school. That was there and they were trying to teach people how to conceal and it 
So a lot of those photos get misconstrued. So I'm pretty sure I know the one he's talking about. No, the, um, the, no this is two British soldiers in battle dress with a with a with a guy a guy who I assume is American wearing the frog pattern camouflage. There's a stone wall behind it, and we're wondering mm. whether it's not staged. But I can't I can't share it and doing it. I can't give myself ready to do it. But mm -hmm. we'll get to the point where we will we will address this myth. So the the, yep. the case presented to the courts today is: Did the camouflage uniform worn by elements of Second Armoured cause friendly fire incidents in Normandy? And that's kind of a our, our answer is categorically no. But there were friendly fires because of the introduction of the M forty three jacket. Is that where is that where we are, Brian? That's the conclusion. Yes, and that the reason that the camouflage gets pinned as being the culprit is because again, in two months, everybody's we're having this great new jacket that's amazing. So it was this cool new thing that came out. And unfortunately, due to guys under stress of combat, they misidentified the new, new uniform as being the new uniform. And they threw it away. And this is how history's mysteries get created, yeah. you know? And folks, I would urge you to go out and look for this, because if you're anything like me, you'll find lots of times it gets repeated. Because it's, as we said, it's one of those things reenactors say it museum staff say it veterans say it, it gets passed around at reunions get passed around by military collectors you know if you see one of those uh, uniforms in a museum it will often it, people say oh that's the one that they used to mistake it for ss and it's just one of those stories that grows and grows and grows and when you actually go back to the beginning there isn't very much to base it on which is the whole point of these shows so um well i think we've we've we've, we've safely covered the subject um there are friendly fire instances we've covered also the introduction of uniforms into the theater which is a bonus for the for the show and we we, mm -hmm. we like doing that so um yeah well thanks very much we will we will bring it to an end but if you've got any more of these ideas to, to come forward and talk about something else brian tamp something tank destroyer related we haven't really done a tank Ooh. destroyer in the <laughs> show um I know a lot about TDs. a little bit about so. um about about tank destroyers with us but yeah something about the i particularly like like i i like the toad early tank destroyer units i find them a little bit more yeah. interesting than the later ones when it's wheel but if you want to come on and talk about tank destroyer units and normally that'd be really cool we can talk about toad we can talk about converted we can talk about tracked anything i'm actually working on a film right now called seek strike destroy about tank destroyers so uh i'm all ears i'd love to and not a lot of people know about them because it's i can go on a tangent but they were a unit created for a very specific purpose that didn't exist by the time they were created so, you know, there's this very interesting four or five year history that, you know, this, they have a really awesome patch too. So you got to talk about yeah. it. No, the Tank Destroyer will do that. Well, there we are then, folks. So I'll just take your screen for a second and remind me what we've got coming up. And then I'll bring you back in to say goodbye. So, folks, mm -hmm. one more show this week. John Bruning is on tomorrow. There's another show that's postponed, Race of Aces. So that's based on his incredible book about the race to become an ace in the Pacific Theater and five particular pilots and their backstories. It's P-38s and P-51s and all sorts of things and Corsairs and all the stuff we like talking about. And then next week, it is that kind of set of shows that have been the kind of different things. Al Murray is coming on to talk about his new book. Mary Louise Roberts is coming on to talk about sheer music. Alan Allport is coming on to talk about the British Army in World War II. Lots of things coming your way. But as always, folks, please consider becoming a subscriber. Consider becoming a patron. Share what we're doing on social media. And if you've got people who are perhaps a bit worried about the long show, send them a link to this one because we're going to come in well under 45 minutes, which is fantastic. So I'll bring Brian back in to say good, good afternoon and goodbye. So um, thanks very much. You've broken your duck. You've done a first World War II TV mm -hmm. appearance. And we'll be happy to see you again. So did you enjoy talking to the group? Oh, for sure. Yep. And I, I love bringing these things to light, you know, and studying the debate. Because history is just is awesome. And again, just to double down, who cares if you have a degree? To study it, learn it, buy as many books as you can, get in it, live it, breathe it, love it. It's just, let's solve these mysteries together, you know? Brilliant. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. This is Paul Wood from World War II TV saying I'll see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye. Cheers.